Colhane from the Big Bit Theory Studios, powered by Bid Prime. We're hanging out here in Austin. Sincerely hope that you and yours are, are doing very well. Our most recent episode addressed the growing homeless crisis in the United States. Thanks again, by the way, to Dr. Kushel, Dr. Margot Kushel. Hopefully our conversation will in some way make a difference. You, as you know, can go to Spreaker iHeart, iTunes, etc. If you missed that important episode of TBBT, there are also, incidentally, there are also quick clips, sound bites out there, out there from our visit. Uh, the The price of admission is the same, regardless if you listen to the full episode or if you track down one of those quick clips. Looking through the glass here in the studio, Rick is here, Mr. Rick Jennings. Rick, that episode on the homeless crisis was well received by our smart and very good looking audience. What did you take away? You know, Bill, no, and so it's really cool that we actually had uh, Dr. Cushell come on to speak about her experience in, I guess it's more of tackling tackling these uh, problems that we're trying to solve pretty much right at the source. And um, even that coming from somebody who's a doctor of medicine and exploring something else uh, that's a little bit outside of her field and what she was doing was uh, really, really neat, really inspiring, and really, I think, gets our uh, gets our listener base to really start thinking about it. But from that, I hope we're going to get some uh, some uh, similar ideas in talking this week with Dr. Clark, where terrorism is concerned. So uh, really excited to see what we're about to hear from him. Dr. Clark certainly, certainly is a, a person who knows a lot about terrorism, counterterrorism. And if you're a longtime listener, Something else you're aware of is that from time to time, not too often, we do reach back out to a guest from previous episodes. More times than not, we steer away from that. There are notable exceptions, and Dr. Clark is one of them. Back in 2016, terrorism was a major concern, just like it is now. We saw from Bid Prime back then that government agencies were very active in acquiring materials, solutions, services to combat terrorism, just like they are now. He already has a premier reputation in the world of researching, studying, and educating on terrorism and counterterrorism. In the past 36 months, obviously, after I visit with Dr. Clark, I've kind of kept an eye on what he's been up to. Well, over the course of those, what is it, plus or minus past 36 months, Dr. Clark has been a sought-after and active expert in the field. You look, and there are an array of appearances on national news quotes in various media sources. If you just Google his name, you'll see that Dr. Clark's been busy. And that includes testifying before various bodies in Congress. Dr. Clark is rightfully recognized as an authority. Now for some official background information. Uh, Dr. Clark is an assistant teaching professor at Carnegie Mellon over in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He's a senior research fellow at the Stufan Center an associate fellow at the International Center for Counterterrorism, in addition to serving as a non-resident senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. He's authored Terrorism, Inc., The Financing of Terrorism, Insurgency, and Irregular Warfare, in addition to Terrorism, The Essential Reference Guide, which came out, I guess, was last year. And now, hot off the presses, Dr. Clark has released another book, After the Caliphate. We'll talk more about that later. Enough words from me. Here's my conversation with Dr. Clark. And now we welcome in Dr. Colin Clark. First of all, Dr. Clark, you, you've been very busy, as I pointed out in the introduction. So we do appreciate you spending some time to share your information with our audience. No problem. Thanks so much for having me. The title of the episode spells it out. Terrorism Revisited the Threat Today. Since you and I spoke, what was it, three plus years ago or so, you know, terrorism continues. In BitPrime's data, we see the massive investment by the public sector, at least in the United States and Canada. Loss of life and property, many billions of dollars are being spent to combat the threat. And also, and I think sometimes people don't realize the investment that's needed in humanitarian efforts as well. So we hear the phrase, follow the money. And when you and I spoke three years ago, you talked about the fact that terrorism, like terrorists, like any organization, they need money. How are terrorist organizations doing today, right now, in terms of being able to raise funds? Are the agencies in the U.S. and elsewhere having any success in making it more difficult for the terrorists to get their hands on and to hold on to resources? 
So, you know, oddly enough, the answer to both questions is yes. Um, so terrorists are continuing to raise money uh, through a range of activities, both um, criminal activities. And uh, I wrote a book in 2015 called Terrorism, Inc., The Financing of Terrorism, Insurgency, and Irregular Warfare. And in that book, I divided terrorist uh, fundraising activities into two types. I talked about, you know, activities that are based purely in what I call the dark economy, and that's, you know, purely illegal ways of uh, gaining revenue, so armed robbery, um, kidnapping for ransom, extortion. And I talked a little about what I call the gray economy as well, which is this kind of quasi-illicit areas, uh, things like soliciting money uh, through charities or raising money through various types of fraud. Um, we saw this with the Islamic State, particularly individuals from Europe that wanted to travel to Turkey and onward to Syria and Iraq to, to join ISIS, uh, raise money through uh, a dizzying array of, of mechanisms, including fraud and petty theft, um, a lot of links with, with criminality. At the same time, the international community, uh, including you know the West and the United States in particular, through the Treasury Department, are leading an effort to counter these groups and individuals. So they're continuing to do it. It's a constant game, uh, to use the cliche, of, of cat and mouse. And we're attempting to stay you know, on pace with the terrorists. But the truth is we're typically two or three steps behind because, um, as you know, we're large lumbering bureaucracies and the terrorists are obviously more nimble and, and far less constrained by laws, authorities, and policies. In your visit back in 2016, you told our audience that you had concerns about the movement of people into the West from war zones and terrorist-infested regions. And, you know, it doesn't take much digging. All you have to do is grab a piece of news off the internet, national news, whatever the case may be, but migrant populations have increased. But what are the concerns inherent with this, and what do you foresee as the potential impact as we look at the days up ahead? So I, I think I've been surprised that um, the uh, return of individuals to the West, it's been far fewer than, than I think myself and most in the policy community have imagined. That said, there there have been um, a number of episodes with individuals that came into uh, you know Europe through the kind of migrant wave, and and for that I would actually just give a small plug for Sam Mullen's book, uh, who's a colleague and friend of mine, and, and has a really great book out just within the last couple of months through Palgrave, where he's got. Um, one of the most comprehensive data sets that I've seen on, on migration and what the implications are for terrorism in the West. What, I, what I'd also say is, you know, as the Sri Lanka Easter attacks have demonstrated, it's not just the West that we have to be worried about. In fact, um, the, the, the West, you know, have, in particular Europe and the United States, have far greater resources, have done, uh, done much to harden their borders and, are, and have relied on emerging technologies including biometrics to build these kind of robust databases. Um, but, but countries that are less developed, including countries like Sri Lanka, particularly those that have been impacted by decades of civil war, um, have, you know, porous borders, perhaps weak security forces, or in the case of Sri Lanka, security forces that are focused on a different threat. Those are uh, areas that I'd be particularly concerned about moving forward, you know, as well as just countries closer to the region and geographical proximity to the war zone. Um, and here I, I mentioned Turkey because I think Turkey is um, a country that's going to be especially vulnerable over the next five years to the kind of aftermath of the Islamic State's caliphate. So what happens next? Um, because this is a country that you know, I wouldn't label a failed state, but actually provides safe haven or sanctuary to terrorists and is connected to the global economy, is connected to, you know, advanced transportation and communication uh, systems. So I'd be concerned that Turkey is almost a staging ground for attacks planned elsewhere. And then also, you know, as I mentioned, countries like uh, Sri Lanka and elsewhere throughout South Asia that, that may not be as prepared for the return of foreign fighters. I keep making reference, Dr. Clark, to our, our conversation when you and I first met uh, a few years ago. Here in the U.S., a goal is to ID the threats in real time. I think you, you kind of use that phrase about being able to be able to identify the terrorists. And you talked about how we're really good in the United States, and I guess it includes the West, as the event happens, we investigate, and we're good at apprehending. But what is the U.S. using? You mentioned biometrics a moment ago. So how are we doing on real-time efforts? And 
What about tackling the softer side? I, I think you used the phrase softer side of terrorism. And it, you even mentioned uh, things like social media platforms. Uh, there was a report this morning where Facebook is trying to crack down on terrorists exploiting Facebook as a tool to recruit. So you mentioned biometrics. So what yes. else? What else are we So doing? there's a lot there. I'm glad that you're referencing our, our prior um, conversation, although I'm a little bit concerned that hopefully you're not scrutinizing how many things I got wrong. You're being polite and mentioning <laughs> the things that I was somewhat prescient about, but there's probably a lot more that I got wrong, um, particularly <laughs> – Making predictions about the Middle East is something I gave up a long time ago. It's just never uh, – yeah. it, it's a very complex region. I'd say a couple of things. I think first, monitoring these things as they happen in real time, there's some, some significant problems there, particularly harnessing new technologies and uh, the advent of big data, machine learning, um, and, and artificial intelligence, although I'd caution that it, it's exactly that. It's promise, right? Um, so there are some people that are really optimistic that these technologies will provide us with certain capabilities uh, in the near term or on the horizon, but I'm just not so sure. And I've been looking at this a lot. Look, if you look at a, take, take France, uh, for example, this is a country that maintains the so-called S list with the name of upwards of 20,000 individuals, quote unquote, suspected of radicalization. And I think to myself, okay, what, how do you weight or rank, you know, these individuals? What's the difference between who's number three on that list and who's number 18,274? Uh, and, and, you know, we're still unable to, and for good reason, predict human behavior. You could have a lot of individuals that have certain behavioral indicators, but how do you predict who's going to spring into action and actually take that step from, you know, talking big things online, but actually doing something that's a bit more minority report. And um, I think there's a lot of obstacles, not only technical challenges, but um, issues surrounding privacy um, and, and other issues that we just haven't kind of ironed out yet. And for good reason, this is a really difficult challenge. I'd say on the softer side of, of counterterrorism, um, that, that's kind of more of a political issue. And, and you can see that as different administrations or different governments take control. And so in, in, in the West, not only in the United States, but in Europe too, that becomes more or less of a priority depending on the government that's in power. And, and there I'm talking really just about allocating resources because these are finite resources to more kinetic activities in counterterrorism versus, you know, things like terrorism prevention efforts or countering violent extremism efforts, whatever you want to call them. Even that term itself is somewhat politically loaded um, in terms of how much we allocate toward diplomacy and soft power efforts, how much we dedicate toward humanitarian assistance and foreign aid. Um, and then finally, I think, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, and, and this is obvious to anyone that listens to your show or anyone that, frankly, reads a newspaper, the threat extends far beyond the threat of, of Salafi jihadism. Uh, we've got a threat from right-wing extremism or violent white supremacy uh, that's impossible mm -hmm. to ignore. And so how do you figure out where to allocate resources um, and how to kind of bolster counterterrorism policy efforts toward the threat that uh, is not only in front of your face, but where the threat's going in the future? And, and this is hard work, so it's easier for me to sit up here and Monday morning quarterback and say, you should have done this, you should have done that. You know, I'm trying to be part of the solution, and, and that's part of what my research is geared toward, is, is identifying threats and laying out these problems. And, you know, where I can, of course, being very cognizant of difficulty and, and trying to remain modest in doing so, offering policy recommendations that I hope can be helpful. I think everyone in, in our audience and uh, that's a great segue, your response there. Everyone in our audience understands that uh, terrorism, it, you're right, it, it isn't a Middle East issue or an Africa issue or a Europe problem. It affects everyone on a global scale. And you talked about domestic terrorism. Well, just as a, a side note, three weeks after you and I spoke back in 2016, uh, Sean and Brody Copeland, a father and his 11-year-old son, from here in Austin were two of the victims of the terrorist truck attack at the French Riviera on Bastille Day. Wow. So, ter yeah, I, it, yeah, it was, it was horrible. And I actually have a relationship with some people who know the Copeland family. So it, it, hits, it hits home, even if, even if you're Look, here in I Austin. I speak to Texas. you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where the Tree of Life attack happened. It happened in the neighborhood I was living in, Squirrel Hill. It, um, yeah. And so I'm reminded of it every day, twice a day, as I as I drive by and, and see that and remember the horrible things that happen here. So, so it, yeah, it, it touches everyone. And 
it, it's not something that, that happens across the ocean. Back when you and I spoke, you detailed Pakistan at that point, and we're talking about, I think it was June, June of 2016, you detailed Pakistan as being the prevailing terrorist threat. Well, Dr. Clark, you've had three years worth of sleeps since then. Uh, when it comes to terrorism today, who or where most makes you toss and turn? I heard you mention Turkey at the beginning yeah. of our conversation. Yeah, so still very concerned uh, about Turkey for, for obvious reasons. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, so with the end of the, the territorial caliphate, the question that I'm often asked is what happens next with the Islamic State? Obviously, I've spent the last two and a half years um, writing a book about that topic after the caliphate, and so thinking about what happens next. And there's really no shortage of candidates for where the Islamic State could uh, prove to become most resilient. I mean, from North Africa to Southeast Asia, take your pick. You know, And then there's countries like Sri Lanka that really weren't on the radar of myself or most other folks, and, and now we realize they have the capability to link up with local groups there to cause damage and destruction. But if we're talking about you know, nation states, I I would be remiss if I didn't mention Saudi Arabia, because that's a country that continues to export uh, Wahhabism and throw money around the globe, where it it perpetuates this ongoing sectarian conflict uh, between Sunni and Shia, um, is active in sending money to uh, groups linked to to radical and extremist causes throughout the world. And so that's a country, (laughs) look, I, I mean, I don't know how how often you can talk about this without uh, just becoming frustrated, but this is uh, the the Saudis' behavior has been moderated little since 9-11, right? And and lest we forget that, even though at the same time, this is a country that uh, is at least nominally a U.S. ally. Dr. Clark, you you and I have mentioned after the caliphate uh, a number of times. Daniel Bynum from Georgetown University said, and, and I quote, a pioneering work that puts the rise of the Islamic State in perspective and makes compelling arguments about the threats it will pose in the years to come. Your most recent book, who is your target audience? What is the focus of the book, if you could go into a little more detail? And what do you hope will be the, the takeaways? Yeah, so I think the target audience is, uh, is really everyone from the undergraduate students that I teach. I'm a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, and I teach courses on terrorism and insurgency and social media technology and conflict all the way to, you know, just the general citizen that's interested in learning more about this topic, up to, you know, policymakers and, and counterterrorism officials and academics that, that follow this. So I, I really try to uh, write to a fairly broad audience to make it accessible, but at the same time to include, you know, high-level uh, analysis um, and, and make it rigorous enough academically that those that, that do this for a living would be interested um, in, in reading the book as well. So, you know, the, the, it's, it's really just kind of, it was a fun book to write because it was one big thought exercise, which I rarely get to do these days, which is what happens next, right? Um, I, I spent so much time the past few years thinking about this, writing about this. I think in 2017, I put out 36 op-eds. So, you know, clearly, uh, not all, but almost, almost all related to this subject. So, um, reading and consuming the academic literature that's out there of, you know, the terrorism studies community. Um, and, and this kind of broader network. You know, some of the takeaways are, are things like, you know, that, that you've probably heard quite often, which is that this is far from over, right, against the Islamic State. This is yeah. a group that's changing from a centrally kind of more hierarchical organization now to a decentralized network. Um, and, and one of the things that I think quite a bit about is similarities between the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda. They're hard to ignore, right? And so looking at the evolution of Al-Qaeda over the last three decades, and what happened to that group after its core was broken apart um, in the aggressive counterterrorism campaign spearheaded by the United States post 9-11, right? Its affiliates found out all over the globe in places like Yemen, North Africa, um, Southeast Asia, the, the Horn of Africa, um, and elsewhere. And then what happens as the command and control network from the core to the affiliates changes, right? So one of the results is you have groups like Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, which becomes a highly capable affiliate or franchise group in its own right, um, that, that group gains more notoriety. You have uh, another spinoff group, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, led by Abu Musab al-Zarqali, right, really kind of distanced itself from the core uh, group that remained in Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, and, and kind of strike out on its own. And, and we see this in so 
some of the captured correspondence where Ayman al-Zawahiri was writing letters to Zarqawi, basically saying, hey, cool it with attacking Shiites. This isn't about sectarianism, to which Zarqawi you know, replied, uh, don't worry, I, I got this, right? This is kind of, we're doing our own thing out here. And, and to no one's surprise, um, AQI ultimately morphed into um, the Islamic State. And so if you think about that same process playing itself out with the IS, right, you could have these affiliate groups in places like Libya or the Philippines or Afghanistan kind of spin off and become stand up, standalone organizations in their own right. And so it's this, um, you know, it's this evolution. It's a metamorphosis in many ways. Um, and again, to, to use a cliche that I often hate, uh, but I do think is apt, it's like whack-a-mole. Right. So how do you contain this yeah. threat before before this group latches on to civil wars and insurgencies in other countries, begins parroting those local grievances and attempting them to tie them to this global narrative that the Islamic State puts forth? And then you have the added dimension, I think, as well of, of cyberspace. This is a group that uh, is able to act far more nimbly and agile in the virtual realm than Al Qaeda was ever able to. And, and when you think about recruiting, financing, propaganda, there's a lot there to carry this this group forth, you know, for the better part of the next decade, if not longer. There you go, friends. The book is After the Caliphate and uh, Dr. Clark. Uh, so impressed by by the work that you're doing. As I, I mentioned to a few people since you and I did first visit a few years ago, I've uh, kept an eye on the work that you've been doing. And it, it's amazing how seemingly you can be in 10 different places at one time, <laughs> putting out so much content, so much work related to terrorism. Oh, thanks so much. I appreciate it. And I'm just glad for, for the continued interest and um, happy to be, you know, someone that engages in, in the community and um, and continues to do work in this area. So I'm, I'm very thankful for that. All right. Well, Dr. Clark, Rick and Kevin, our producers will be sure to include a little bit more about your book after the caliphate in the description of the podcast. We'll also try to put a link to the book as well. So anyone listening in our audience, be sure to uh, be sure to check it out. Dr. Clark, uh, best of luck to you, safe travels, and hopefully we'll uh, cross paths again at some point down the road in the future. Thanks so much. Look forward to it. Thanks again, Dr. Clark. As Dr. Clark covered, there's so much involved in discussing a topic like terrorism. But yes, we do have to live our lives. We do have to be aware, however, uh, what's going on in the world around us. And certainly, most, most certainly, that includes terrorism as well. Now it's that time again for Crazy Bids. And we'll stay on topic somewhat from, from their own reporting by the United States Agency for International Development Office of the U.S. Foreign Disaster Assistance. In 2018, the U.S. government allocated over $1.5 billion in humanitarian assistance to support humanitarian programs in Syria. Well, you need people to manage and carry out those programs. The U.S. government, and looking in the BidPrime database, the U.S. government is seeking applications from qualified U.S. citizens to serve as disaster assistance response team deputy team leaders in Syria. Some of the specs. It's a one-year assignment with four one-year options. You'll be stationed in Amman, Jordan, Adana, Turkey, or Washington, D.C. How will you get ready for your assignment, you ask? They're going to be, there will be an initial training program in D.C. for three months, which will include formal classroom training and on-the-job training and may include security training. So there you go. Uh, a crazy bid. I just in the sense that we always talk about governments need buy, look for anything and everything, and, and there it is. Uh, it includes it includes providing assistance to Syria. That'll wrap things up. Thank you so much for sharing, downloading, and following the Big Bit Theory. It takes each of us to spread this important information. Email. You can email me at bcolhane at bidprime.com. You can follow us on Twitter at the Big Bid Theory. My Twitter handle is contract underscore Hunter. And don't forget to stop by the show's Facebook page as well. Powered by Bid Prime for the folks here at TBBT. Looking forward to the impending stretch of 45 straight days with 100 plus degree temperatures here in Austin. Many thanks to Dr. Clark. Be sure to get your copy of After the Caliphate. We have to live our lives, like I said, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be aware, right? Thanks to Rick Jennings for making the magic happen behind the glass. This is Bill Colhane. Until next time. Go Gunners, Barracudas, Tigers, Bobcats, and Cubs. 
and we wish you all the best in growing your business. Powered by Bid Prime, we thank you for tuning in to The Big Bid Theory. From Austin, Texas, the show is produced by Bill Colhane and Jim Ward. Producer and engineer is Rick Jennings. Distribution research and production assistance by Lauren Jones and Kevin Henderson. You can find other episodes of The Big Bid Theory on platforms to include iHeart, iTunes, Spreaker, and Google Play. So much fun.